out, and there's lots of room up here if people would like to come closer, but I know the comfy seats do have an allure in the back, so you're quite welcome to, uh, to stay there too. So, um, welcome to the Island Lecture Series. This is a program of the Institute of Island Studies, which has been running off and on since the late 1980s. We used to have full um, months of lectures um, every Monday or Tuesday night, and uh, we'd have about eight or ten, and the lectures would go out into the, the communities, and uh, that was many years ago, and so now we're lucky if we can have it monthly, and um, during the pandemic, we only had a couple online, so it's so good to be able to come back and be in person in this, in this room, um, which is where we've traditionally had them. So, um, I, as we gather today, it is important to respectfully acknowledge the history, the spirituality, culture, and rights of all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples from coast to coast to coast, um, who have called this land home since time immemorial, and who continue to experience the ongoing effects of colonialism and systemic racism. This acknowledgement is nothing without action to back it up, and I encourage everyone to consider how we can each, in our own way, actively honor and uphold our obligations in the spirit of true reconciliation. After all, we are all treaty people. So when you came onto campus, you probably noticed the TP out there that was put up this summer um, as part of the new um, Indigenous Knowledge Education Research something, it's I-K-E-R-A-S, a new faculty that uh, is uh, devoted to Indigenous education on UPEI campus, so really proud that we're, we're making that step here. So for those of you who don't know me, and I, there might be a couple, I'm Dr. Lori Brinklow. Um, I'm the chair of the Institute of Island Studies Executive Committee and coordinator of the Master of Arts and Island Studies program. Um, the IIS, as we call it in the short, short form, is a research, education, and public policy institute based just down the hall, on the way to the washroom if you need it, um, which is the second and last door on the left before you go around the corner. It's always important to know where um, the amenities are. There's also a water fountain around the corner as well. So you can learn about more about what we do by checking out our website, which is very simple, islandstudies.com or through our social media accounts. And uh, we also have a monthly newsletter, so if you're not already subscribed, I do have a sign-up sheet, and we promise not to sell any of the data to the highest bidder, maybe the lowest bidder, but no, just kidding. So if, feel free to add your name um, and your email address, and then you can get notices of many of our events, as well as a pretty awesome compendium, actually, of Island Studies news from around the world, not just from Prince Edward Island, but uh, some of the things that uh, other countries and islands are doing. So today, we're just so pleased to be able to launch our Island Lecture Series again, and um, we have uh, Dr. Don Rothwell with us. He approached us several months ago about a planned visit to Prince Edward Island as part of a book tour promoting his new book, Islands and International Law, I see it over there on the, the, the table, which was published this last July in Australia. So we've all heard about the significant roles that islands play in the international arena, especially these days. Uh, so here's a chance to learn more in this lecture, what's law got to do with it? And every time I saw that, Tina Turner just, thank you for that earworm, it's been really useful over the last month. <laughs> you know, it's a wonderful title and I really loved it. So, um, Donald Rothwell is a professor of international law at the Australian National University College of Law um, in Canberra, Australia. He was born on the island continent of Australia, I love that. Um, he is a graduate of the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary and has lived on Vancouver Island and studied islands and the law of the sea for 30 years. So I would like to ask Dr. Donald Rothwell to the stage and uh, please Join me in welcoming him. Welcoming him. Thanks uh, so much, Laurie. Uh, I also uh, acknowledge the Indigenous peoples of this country as I acknowledge also the Indigenous peoples and First Nations people of Canberra, the region that I come from. Um, tonight is a very significant night for me because um, I was reflecting on the fact that it's been three years since I've spoken to an international audience in person. 
uh, thanks to the effects of uh, an event that we've all uh, had to live through over the last few years. And in the case of my island home, closed borders, uh, which have only been opened uh, since uh, uh, December. Which brings me to um, perhaps some very preliminary reflections. Um, and that is, I just referenced the fact that I come from an island. Now, when I was a child in elementary school, Australian children were taught two things about Australia, in addition to other things, of course. That was that we were the smallest continent in the world, to which myself and my other school friends sighed. But then we were told we were the largest island in the world, for which we particularly got excited. And I've been reflecting on that a little bit, um, in that Australia is probably a very unique place in that when you see the daily weather report for Australia, as Laurie now knows, you see an image of a whole island, in brackets, continent, which is a very unusual aspect of thinking about the weather for a whole country comprising this whole island feature. But the island and continent debate is one that we can, um, we can have uh, in, in a range of settings, I guess. I also just wanted to reflect a little bit <coughs> on my journey coming here. I left uh, an island, we'll call it Australia, my first sighting of Canada as I sat in the window seat on QF75 last Tuesday was of Vancouver Island. And as the plane descended, I landed on Sea Island at Vancouver International Airport where I spent a very pleasant six hours before I departed for another island, Montreal, uh, where I spent uh, a few more days. So I spent quite a few days on islands, continents, and, uh, and now on Prince Edward Island, which I'm very pleased to be at. This is my fourth visit here, by the way. And the final observation I'll make by way of reflections <coughs> is something that King Charles said just the other day which I was very struck by. King Charles referenced the sympathies that were being extended uh, around uh, the United Kingdom, uh, the Commonwealth, and also the realms and territories of the United Kingdom following the, the death of Queen Elizabeth. And that was a very interesting reference for me with respect to islands because the United Kingdom, of course, has a number of overseas island territories scattered throughout various parts of the world. Some of them have really fascinating acronyms, such as BIOT, the, Brit uh, the British Indian Ocean Territories, the, of course, the, the Falkland Islands. Um, but there are also realms, and the realms in particular have a very distinct relationship with the British Crown, where they have allegiance to the Crown, but they are not formally part of the United Kingdom. And here we're talking uh, places such as the Isle of Man, uh, Guernsey, and, and Jersey. So those references just in the last few days reflected on aspects of my own work on islands and international law, uh, and also uh, some of the work that we think about in terms of island studies. So, uh, to what I'm going to be um, speaking about this evening, um, I, I'm really trying to raise some questions for you to get you to think about islands and, and international law, perhaps in ways that you may not have thought about these questions uh, previously. And to sort of highlight some of the ways in which the international legal issues around islands have become particularly prominent uh, in recent years. And I'm going to initially start with a question of characterisation. Lawyers love to characterise things. How do we legally define certain terms? I remember that when I first started studying law, 
um, one of the big questions was, well, could you write a dog act in which a piece of legislation regulating dogs actually regulated something that would look like a cat? And the answer was that yes, you could. Law could regulate certain activities in ways that would be quite obscure or diverse or absurd. And so one of the initial questions that we need to think about from a legal perspective in terms of characterising islands is what exactly is an island and from the particular perspective that I'm looking at, an island from the perspective of international law. So I'm going to show you some images here to get you to think about this a little bit, to ask the question, are these features islands? So I'll just run through these slides and you can make some mental notes as to whether or not you think some of these features are or are not islands. So, those are the questions that I sort of want to pose in terms of thinking about these features. How many of those features were islands, do you think, from the perspective of international law? Does anyone want to offer any, any thoughts? Yes? Well, some of them were like just metaphorical and artificial islands, you know, and they do not hold, uh, uh, you know, uh, international law would not be Yeah. So we can go back. That's the island. So, Only one of those features was an island from the perspective of international law, um, and it's actually an island state. That's Nauru. Um, the other features were, yes, artificial islands. Uh, some of the features were, of course, what international law calls installations or structures as such. Um, icebergs have characteristics that are similar to islands, but they're clearly not islands as we understand them from an international legal perspective. Um, but of course, some of those features um, have become particularly contentious in certain parts of the world. And that's especially the case in terms of uh, the South China Sea. And I'll come back and pick up some of those points a little later. But I guess. These are the sort of questions that have become increasingly contentious in international relations, geopolitics, and international law. And what I want to try to explore this evening is to give an explanation as to why these features have become so contested and the definition associated with islands have become uh, so important over the course of the last uh, decade uh, in particular. And ultimately what I'm going to be saying is that much of that is driven by the entitlements, the rights, the ownership that accrues through being able to possess an island as that feature is recognised for the purposes of international law. I'm not going to delve deep into the intricacies of the law, but I'll try to give you some broad understanding of some of the key points. So, I'm going to start with the definition of an island which is provided for under the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So there's a particular provision in that international treaty, Article 121, and interestingly uh, it's called a regime of islands, but this gives us some clues to some of the contentious issues that have arisen with respect to the status of islands uh, in recent years. Now, I'll unpack that in a little bit more detail as I move through this discussion, but the first point we'll see is that an island is a naturally formed feature, 
So that immediately raises issues about a naturally formed feature and an artificially formed feature. And then paragraph two here talks about the entitlements of an island with respect to maritime zones, and I'll discuss that. And then it makes this important distinction between an island and a rock. An island and a rock. And that island-rock distinction uh, is the one that's become really very contentious in international law and international geopolitics. I'm actually just going to go back through the slides to show you <coughs> an example of a feature that was claimed to be an island, this feature here, Rock Hall, uh, which sits uh, in the Irish Sea off the coast of Scotland. And Britain claimed Rock Hall as an island for a very long period of time, predominantly because of the maritime entitlements that Rock Hall would have generated to a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone and a 200 nautical mile continental shelf. Britain eventually conceded that this feature was not an island, as per the definition that I've showed you under the law of the sea, and accepted that Rock Hall was in fact a rock. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, this feature doesn't generate the very large maritime zones of a continental shelf or an exclusive economic zone. It only generates an entitlement to a territorial sea. That's one of the few examples of where um, a country has made a concession that a feature originally understood or originally claimed to have these very large entitlements as an island has now been accepted as being a rock as opposed to an island. So, Article 121 has become a very contested area in international law and that's especially been the case as a result of debates and discussions that have been taking place uh, in the South China Sea. So to unpack some of those uh, definitions and those elements that exist within uh, the Law of the Sea Convention and the island and rock distinction. Uh, Article 121, paragraph 3 talks about the fact, the fact that a rock which cannot sustain human habitation or an economic life of its own shall have no exclusive economic zone or a continental shelf. So countries can still claim sovereignty or territoriality or entitlements over rocks and rocks come in all shapes and sizes, of course. But if a rock doesn't meet the international legal criteria of being an island under Article 121, its significance is much diminished because it doesn't have an exclusive economic zone or a continental shelf. And for a, a small feature, those maritime entitlements can be very significant and significant to the country that claims uh, those entitlements. So that's become the really contested area and it's an issue that international lawyers have begun to really debate and focus on uh, over the last uh, few years. The South China Sea has become the test case. You'll be familiar with the fact that lawyers love to run test cases, like to raise arguments before courts and tribunals to try to get a resolution of a contested area. And this was the key feature in the test case. And that was the test case between the Philippines and China that was determined uh, by an international tribunal uh, in 2016. Uh, and the feature is it either um, currently occupied by Taiwan or the Republic of China. The reason why this feature became the test case was that in the South China Sea, and in particular within the group of islands known as the Spratly Island Group, Ita Aba is the largest of the features. So the view that was taken by the international lawyers presenting the case on behalf of the Philippines was that they would work with Ita Aba, present all of the detail before the court on the status of Ita Aba, and once the tribunal was able to make a decision on Ita Aba, various consequences would flow in terms of the ultimate decision-making processes. 
This feature was determined to be a rock for the purposes of Article 121 of the Law of the Sea Convention. And the ultimate justification for that was that the view that was taken by the court was that Ita Aba could not sustain human habitation without significant outside or significant external support effectively coming from uh, Taiwan. Uh, and factors associated with that was that there, were no, there was no fresh water uh, that was readily available on Ita Aba. There was no history of being able to grow any crops on Ita Aba. So the ability of humans to sustain themselves on the feature was exceptionally limited without enormous amounts of external support. <coughs> there was also evidence of artificial works that had been done on Ita Aba uh, by the Republic of China, uh, Taiwan, uh, over a period of time. So once a decision was made on this feature not being an island, all of the other much smaller features in the South China Sea that were contested in the matter between the Philippines and China were also not held to be islands and ultimately they were held to be rocks or in some cases what are called low tide elevations. So that gives you one example of the way in which an international court has looked at this issue and that had immediate consequences in terms of a range of maritime entitlements in the South China Sea. Now, of course, one of the aspects of the definition of an island is that it must be permanent. And yet we can identify some examples of newly formed uh, volcanic islands uh, in various parts of the world, but as a general proposition, these features have very limited lifespans. They will be formed through volcanic eruptions, they'll be very spectacular of course, but over two or three years they will eventually erode away uh, and so they will subsume into a collection of small rocks or they will sit below at sea level. So while islands are being formed, in some parts of the world through volcanic activity, they rarely have significant levels of permanence associated with them. One of the interesting dimensions of the South China Sea case, which has generated a lot of scholarly debate amongst international lawyers, is what about size? Is size a significant feature or factor? in terms of making determinations as to what is or what is not an island. And if you recollect the features that I spoke about in Article 121, there's no mention of size of an island or a rock as being relevant. And um, this has generated a bit of debate in the Australian Government, I can tell you, because this feature here is Heard Island uh, in the Sub-Antarctic, uh, which um, I've just called it an island, so by definition it has to be an island, of course. Uh, this was not something that was the subject of discussion in the South China Sea case, but you can fairly quickly tell that it might not necessarily be the easiest place to live, because it's located in the sub-Antarctic, and there's no history of any human habitation on Heard Island. Uh, the only human habitation that's been there has been occasional uh, scientific expeditions that may uh, spend the summer season on the island, but there's no permanent human habitation on Heard Island, um, and yet Australia claims Heard Island as an island for the purposes of international law. Uh, it has similar features to Canadian Arctic Islands, I would suggest to you, though this one is probably a little smaller than many of Canada's Arctic Islands. So, that highlights for you some of the other debates that have existed and generated as to whether or not the, the way in which some countries have claimed features as, as islands are now possibly going to be contested in certain uh, international uh, fora. As I've suggested to you, the reason why this debate has taken on such significance is because of the maritime dimensions, the maritime entitlements 
uh, associated with these uh, various features. And the ones that we really need to focus on are not so much the territorial sea, because a rock generates a territorial sea, as indeed does an island, but rather the much more expansive exclusive economic zones and continental shelves. And of course we predominantly associate exclusive <coughs> economic zones with fisheries, rights and entitlements, continental shelves with respect to oil and gas uh, rights and entitlements, which for certain states can bring in uh, not only uh, vast economic resources and rights and entitlements, but also have a significant impact upon the ability of that country's economy uh, to grow and to be sustainable. And in the case of Pacific Island countries, uh, a 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone with respect to fish docks is really important in terms of the sustainability of some of those countries. And this image here gives you a bit of a sense that if we see this as an island, well you can then understand how a very small feature, which is a legitimate island, can generate very expansive uh, maritime entitlements uh, consistent with the law of the sea. So that effectively what the law of the sea says is that an island enjoys the same entitlements as a continent. No distinction at all in that regard. And so this is the reason why these issues have become such a focus of debate and discussion. This slide here just highlights that in terms of if you think about some of these small island states and territories, uh, Tuvalu, Nauru, Niue and Tonga, um, you can see the difference in the land area dimension with the exclusive economic zone dimension and the significant ratios in favour of the maritime entitlement that that feature and that state enjoys consistent with the law of the sea. So for these small island countries, they don't necessarily see themselves so much as a land domain, but rather a maritime domain. And we see that very much reflected in the South Pacific to a lesser degree uh, in, the, in the Caribbean. And so, uh, at the moment, there's a significant focus in the South Pacific in particular on uh, promoting a, a blue ocean economy view of how these small island states should be viewed. And it really revolves around the extent of the exclusive economic zones uh, that those features enjoy. <coughs> now, I should emphasize there's really no issue at all about these features being islands for the purposes of international law but it highlights how a very small feature can generate an enormous maritime entitlement under current international legal frameworks. And so that is really highlighted uh, in the case of the South Pacific. Uh, when you look at a, a maritime map of the South Pacific, seeing all of the very small island states that are dotted uh, throughout the Southwest Pacific in particular, um, and then reflect upon the extent of the maritime zones that those features uh, generate. And so basically, uh, we have located in the southwest Pacific uh, to the uh, east of Australia in the north of New Zealand, a whole series of very small island states in which all of those features have exclusive economic zones of 200 nautical miles. They overlap in many cases, which means that there needs to be maritime boundaries associated with that and that becomes the dominant focus of how those states view themselves at a geopolitical level and it all revolves around these international legal entitlements. Now I should say that that raises another issue, something that I'm not intending to address in much detail at all this evening, but it raises the issue of sea level rise and the impact of sea level rise on whether or not some of the maritime entitlements of some of these island states may well be extinguished as a result of the effect of climate change. And that's been an issue that uh, countries in the Pacific and also the Caribbean have started to raise for debate and discussion uh, in recent years. So 
Just another illustration of this uh, can be seen in the case of Heard Island. I showed you a, a slide of that previously. I'm just going to come over to this side of that screen. Um, so uh, this is Heard Island, which I showed you with the, the snow-capped uh, mountain. But this here is an image showing the maritime entitlement generated from Heard Island. This here is the, the limit of the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone. But because of the structure of the continental shelf that exists in the Southern Ocean, uh, Heard Island generates uh, a continental shelf that extends uh, over 350 nautical miles uh, from the island itself, deep into the Southern Ocean, right up to the edge of the Antarctic continent. This might be seen as an extreme example, and most likely is, but once again, it just highlights the maritime entitlement uh, that a very small feature uh, can generate. So I want to switch from that um, to make a few observations about uh, artificial islands, because that has also become a very contested area uh, in recent years. So artificial islands, generally speaking, do not possess the same entitlements, they don't have the same rights as a naturally formed island, as we understand that. Um, but there is an evolving set of practices with states building and expanding and exploring multiple options with respect to building artificial islands in many different settings. Uh, that one's in uh, Tokyo Bay. Uh, so that's within uh, internal waters of Japan, so there's no real significant issue with that. Um, that are the palms of Dubai, which I've had the privilege of flying over on, on a few occasions, but there's no real issues with that because it's built within the territorial sea of the United Arab Emirates. This here is Fiery Cross Reef, which doesn't look like a reef anymore, um, but has been subject, of course, to land reclamation undertaken by China and was a very contested issue in the South China Sea arbitration. And so international lawyers have begun to focus around the issue of, well, is it legitimate to build artificial islands and under what circumstances can artificial islands uh, be built? And the answer is that yes, artificial islands can be built and there's a, a, a basic framework under international law under which they can be uh, constructed. They can be constructed in what's called internal waters within the territorial sea, even within the exclusive economic zone or within the continental shelf. But one of the key issues is that to be able to construct an artificial island, you must be a legitimate coastal state. You must be the legitimate country who has an entitlement over that maritime zone to be able to build that particular feature. And that's been one of the contested issues in the South China Sea setting. So another distinctive international law issue uh, that's arisen, though is perhaps not as contested these days as it used to be, uh, is the whole issue of archipelagos and their status uh, under international law. And international lawyers began to give this issue consideration in the 50s and the 60s in terms of what they then called mid-ocean archipelagos, asking questions about what particular entitlements or status should archipelagos such as those that make up Fiji or the Hawaiian Islands should have. And the primary drivers in that debate revolved around the status of uh, Indonesia and the Philippines at the time. And once again, the law of the sea perspective on that was that prior to the adoption of the 1982 UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, Archipelagos were just seen as perhaps countries comprised of islands or parts of islands. They enjoyed various maritime entitlements, but they weren't necessarily connected in any way, so that all of these features would have a territorial sea, they might have an exclusive economic zone or a continental shelf, but there wasn't necessarily any connection uh, between those particular island uh, features. And then, in the 1970s, a decision was made to recognise the distinctive status of those features by calling them archipelagic states, in other words, making a distinctive category 
for island nations. And so if you were a legitimate archipelagic state for the purposes of the Law of the Sea Convention, you would have additional entitlements which other countries wouldn't necessarily uh, enjoy. So we're now in a position where there are 22 archipelagic states uh, recognised under international law. And they can include islands and parts of islands. So Papua New Guinea is a good example of that, which is an archipelagic state which shares an island uh, with Indonesia. Uh, but the Hawaiian archipelago, or islands that make up the Hawaiian archipelago, are not an archipelagic state because, of course, they are connected with a continental state, uh, the United States. So here we need to make a distinction between a, a geographic archipelago and a legal or juridical archipelago. Papua New Guinea is an archipelagic state, yes. The Hawaiian Islands are an archipelago, yes, but they're not a juridical archipelago for the purposes of the law of the sea. So this is the current list of uh, the 22 archipelagic states, and you'll notice that they are predominantly in the Caribbean and in the Southwest Pacific, with one or two other exceptions. And there are some interesting dynamics associated with that, uh, one of which would be uh, what would happen if New Caledonia ever became independent from metropolitan France? Because if New Caledonia became independent from metropolitan France, New Caledonia could also uh, join this uh, particular list. One of the legal issues associated with archipelagic states uh, is the drawing of what are called baselines, which connect the various outer limits of the archipelago, and here you can see the complexity of the archaeologic baselines that connect up the outer limits of Papua New Guinea. And there's an interesting political issue arising here because uh, the island of Bougainville uh, in the eastern sector of Papua New Guinea uh, has a, a significant independence movement, and there may well be prospect of an independent Bougainville emerging uh, in the next five to ten years. Uh, if that was the case, well then there would be a need for an adjustment of the archaeologic entitlements of Papua New Guinea. And we've already seen examples of where archaeologic states have had to adjust their entitlements as a result of the emergence of new states. Here I'm particularly thinking of Indonesia and the emergence of the independent uh, Timor-Leste. So, the way in which these baselines are drawn around the islands of an archipelago is quite significant because there are limits under the Law of the Sea Convention as to how those baselines can be drawn. They're quite technical uh, in dimensions, but not surprisingly, countries try to take advantage of the most liberal interpretation as they can possibly find. Um, you'll be interested to know that the United States in particular uh, keeps a very close watch on these entitlements and often will diplomatically protest or object to claims and entitlements which they feel are not consistent with the way in which the Law of the Sea Convention uh, is framed. So I just want to finish up by, by trying to give you a, a bit of a list of the categorisation of the way in which um, my recent work has sought to identify um, the existence of, of various islands. Uh, and so my category has come up with uh, eight different groups, some of which uh, are going to be uh, self-evident uh, to you. Um, independent island states, 45 of those, of which 22 of them are archipelagic states. Um, we've got constituent units of a state of which uh, Prince Edward Island uh, is clearly an example of that. Uh, or Vancouver Island is a, a territorial unit of a constituent unit of Canada, i.e. British Columbia. You've then got some really interesting categories such as islands which are in free association with other states. The Cook Islands has that type of relationship with New Zealand. You've then got states which are in a process of integration 
uh, with a metropolitan state, but which are probably moving towards self-determination and independence. You've then got the United Nations listed non-self-governing territories, of which there are 15, of which they are predominantly all islands. And then you've got uh, the category that lawyers find difficult, so we just call them sui generis. Uh, and they come back to the examples that I spoke about right at the start, such as Jersey, uh, the Isle of Man. And then you've got special regimes, regimes where you've got very distinctive legal mechanisms and frameworks that have been developed for distinctive, unique uh, legal settings uh, and circumstances. Schwalbad, uh, which is Norwegian claimed territory, has the distinction of being, to my knowledge, the only set of islands which are completely governed by an international treaty, uh, the Treaty of Spitsbergen, uh, which was concluded in 1921, which sets up what's called a condominium system for uh, regulation and management of, of, uh, of Schwalbad, in which Norwegian sovereignty is recognised, but which other states, other countries, can have certain rights and entitlements to engage in, in a range of activities on, on Schwalbad. So that's a really unique example and there's no other duplicated examples of those around the world. The Ayland Islands in Finland are perhaps another example of that too. So we've got some special regimes that exist uh, which are quite distinctive and which could possibly be models for other difficult territorial disputes as they exist with respect to islands. So my conclusions then are that clearly islands can generate uh, a range of very legitimate entitlements consistent with mainland or continental states. But because of the entitlements that they generate, and significantly as a result, I think, as a result of the Law of the Sea Convention, the status of an island has become more and more contested, become more and more disputed. The distinction between what is an island and a rock in particular has become very geopolitically contested in certain parts of the world. But what we can also say is that in certain instances we can see the, the status of some of these island features change and the political status of these island features change as a result of the geopolitic, uh, geopolitical circumstances and also the legal dimensions associated uh, with those particular features. So, um, let me conclude by saying once again how delighted I have been to be able to speak to you about these issues this evening. Uh, and can I just add once again my congratulations to, to Laurie and the team for the, the significant legacy in terms of island studies that uh, this university has been responsible for. Um, and whilst um, it, it might be fair to say that there's not necessarily been a huge amount of legal scholarship coming out of this institute, um, scholarship from the institute is certainly referred to uh, in this book in terms of a range of other uh, preliminary dimensions of which I, I discussed this evening. So thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this evening and I look forward to some discussion. studies program here at UPEI from our political studies department. So all of this is resonating, thinking about my classes with him and all the things that he used to talk about. So it's, it's thank you for bringing that up. Do we have some questions or comments? Yes, Satyajit. Satyajit, by the way, is one of our graduates. Uh, he better have some good if questions. Could, uh, <laughs> if you could uh, go back to like, the slides when you showed Papua New Guinea, just had a question, um, the you know, the, the baseline. Now, I know, you know, if you look at that, you know, this could also replicate, uh, you know, you know, a continental states, outer, you know, archipelago, you know, outlying archipelago, you know, the baseline. And there is a debate about the unity theory, right? And, you know, joining. So I was just wondering, like, for example, if, let's say, India, if 
has the, you know, uh, the Andamans and the Global Island chain. And if they use that unity theory, then you are getting more maritime entitlement, right? Uh, but that's not the case. Uh, but in this case, like in Papua New Guinea, why do we have that, you know, in a way, that baseline, um, you know, entitlement? Uh, am I clear on this question? So, f first of all... Because, um, because, because the mainland is, is, in a way, it's... Uh, it can be can be interpreted as being part of a continent rather than you know an island in itself. Does it make sense? It does. It does. Um, first of all, um, thank you for raising that question because um, it allows me to um, talk a little bit more about the uh, aspects of law of the sea convention with respect to archipelagic baselines. Um, the entitlement to, to use this is that a state must be a state or a country comprised of islands or parts of islands. Islands or parts of islands. That's the threshold. Japan and New Zealand and the United Kingdom are countries comprised solely of islands or parts of islands. So they meet that threshold. Canada and Australia are continental states which have lots of islands but they're continental states and they're not states which are predominantly formed by islands. The unique aspect of Papua New Guinea is that it is a state formed with islands and parts of islands because of course it shares an island with Indonesia. So that criteria is met uh, under Article 46 of the, of the Law of the Sea Convention as indeed is the criteria met in the case of Indonesia which also shares islands and parts of islands with now both uh, Papua New Guinea, uh, Timor-Leste, uh, Malaysia and uh, yeah, those three countries. The other aspect of the Law of the Sea Convention's very technical aspects of the baselines is that the baselines must connect up the islands which form the outer aspects of the archipelago and that's the reason why <laughs> these baselines are drawn in such a sort of bizarre sort of fashion. Uh, but because it's reflecting the geography of the circumstances. And the other interesting aspect of the, the formula that's required in Article 47 of the Law of the Sea Convention is that an archipelagic state, once these baselines have been drawn, must comprise nine time, up to nine times more area of water as opposed to land. So there's a land to water ratio that's written into the Law of the Sea Convention. And uh, Papua New Guinea uh, meets that because of the large amount of uh, maritime area uh, that's contained within it. And it's in fact that formula which immediately precludes Japan or New Zealand claiming archipelagic status because there's too much land in the case of those two countries. There is a major technical defect with these uh, baselines and though this, this baseline here, number one, doesn't connect up with the coastline, as you can see. Uh, and that's been the subject of protest from the United States. Does that answer your question, or was there yes, another? Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, I, you know I, I think you pretty much answered the question of the first part. I kind of forgot that you have to partner. But then, you know, the question arises, think about Canada uh, in your Canadian Arctic, right? It's a continental state. Now, when you claim the baseline, you know, States and 
And I think that's where we, when we come to this <coughs> analysis, we need to make a distinction between the entitlements of an island state, Papua New Guinea, and the entitlements of a continental state, Canada, uh, in relation to these issues. And so the Canadian position with respect to the uh, baselines around the Canadian Arctic archipelago has never been framed around uh, this type of entitlement. Um, Canada has never claimed that it's an archipelagic state. Uh, quite clearly, it would be absurd if it ever did so. Um, rather, Canada went out and drew what are called straight baselines, as you've acknowledged, under Article 7 of the Law of the Sea Convention, which was subject to immediate protest by the United States, and which I think still remain controversial uh, but which the Canadian position is one in that uh, Canada says that some of these waters that make up the Canadian Arch Arctic archipelago are historic waters and as a result of that Canada should be able to enjoy uh, distinctive entitlements in relation to uh, that body of water which effectively encompasses the Northwest Passage. That however um, has had an interesting implication in that China is now seeking to advance quite expansive claims with respect to uh, some of its island features in the South China Sea. Uh, China is clearly not an archipelagic state, uh, but China's entitlements and the types of entitlements that they're seeking to claim with respect to these types of baselines bear some similarity to the precedent set by Canada uh, in the 1980s. And so that's a current significant debate that's occurring um, in that particular part of the world. No, my point was precisely on, on you, know, you know, even if they're continental states, you have archipelago which is outlining, you know, you, and, and then, you know, in context of the unity theory, which has been, you know, a kind of, um, I think it's debated, you know, I have great scholars from both sides who have argued and for and against the unity theory. And so I just wanted your, you know, your opinion on that. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Paul. I have a, a couple questions if I may. I noticed that on your list of archipelagic states that Dominican Republic is listed, but Haiti is not. I was just wondering, and you may have already answered that question with the land uh, ratio, but I'm wondering why that is. That's, that's, the, that's the factor which yeah. My, my other question is, what would happen theoretically, or what do you think might happen theoretically, if a state were to take a rock and expand it um, and, and colonize it? Would the International Law of the Sea then recognize that as an island, or is that a potential possibility? Is that what's happening here in China? Yeah, so I guess we've got two situations at the moment. One is which we've got features which were clearly and unequivocally rocks, which have been artificially expanded into artificial islands as a result of construction activities. Now, that raises, I guess, two dimensions. One is, well, does that change the law of the sea characterization of that feature? And in the South China Sea arbitration, the, the court said no, it, do, it doesn't. That, that feature naturally was a rock. It will remain a rock, even though it may now look like this. And the tribunal said, well, Article 60 of the Law of the Sea Convention says that an artificial island doesn't enjoy uh, entitlements to any of the maritime zones that I've spoken about. However, um, as you can see from this slide, and as you can readily see from many other satellite images, um, a number of these constructed artificial islands have been militarised and are now um, have significant military potential. Does that change their status? Well, I guess if you build an artificial island, are there any limits as to what you can use that artificial island for? Uh, 
You can put a casino on your artificial island. You can put an airstrip on your artificial island to support the casino. Or you can build a military base on your artificial island. So that's an area where international law doesn't necessarily create parameters as to what can be legitimately undertaken uh, in terms of an artificial island. So that's the current debate. The looming debate is what happens when natural islands are subsumed as a result of sea level rise and persons who live on natural islands want to go and live on features like this, which have been artificially constructed adjacent to their natural island homes. And we have examples of where that is occurring, not on a significant scale, but that is occurring in some parts of the world. And the technology now exists for this to be done. So that will raise um, another set of really interesting questions at an international legal level and also at a political level uh, in terms of the way in which we conceive of a state for the purposes of international law and international politics and the, the territory of that state being natural territory and artificial territory. And, and those are really active discussions that are occurring, certainly in the Pacific at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Question here and then Alyssa. Yeah. Um, my question was something similar, so I'm <laughs> let it go. My question is what happens when the island becomes a rock? Yeah, so, and, and that's the issue that, that um, the Association of Small Island States uh, and the Pacific Islands Forum uh, are really starting to try to get debate uh, about. So the question is, do rights disappear? Are there, are there residual rights that belong to something which might just be a, a corporation somewhere? Uh, yeah, precisely. So, so, so the argument that's being made at, at, a, at a political level, which is generating debate and discourse in the United Nations and also within what's called the International Law Commission, uh, uh, an international group of jurists who provide advice to the United Nations, is that there should be some discussion and debate about the maintenance of the status quo. If a feature is losing its entitlements as a result of climate change. So that would clearly be the preferred position of the small island states. They would say, well, if our feature is an island, and that's not debated at the moment, and we have generated a, a range of entitlements because our feature is an, an island, and we have maritime arrangements with our neighbouring states because our feature is an island, the fact that that feature may become significantly diminished so that it now becomes a rock, shouldn't actually change its status. So that's the geopolitical and legal debate that we're in at the moment. And that discourse, I suspect, will continue on for the next decade or so. So we've got, we've got a, a, a sort of converse situation here. You've got features that were clearly not islands, looking like islands. And then on the other hand, you've got features that were clearly islands that might become rocks over time. So an interesting dynamic. Cool. Alyssa? So I'm just thinking about features that look like islands that are defined as rocks. So historically they didn't have access to fresh water and rocks. <coughs> but in terms of technology now, we can have desalination plants to get fresh water, we can have genet genetically modified crops that can probably survive on some of these islands. So will there be a challenge in the future where you can now have fresh water and crops, you can have solar and I guess wind power to on your island, so you can make it a sustainable island with some human intervention, would that ever be considered an island in the future? I think that's an excellent question, and it, and it highlights the fact that uh, for us as international lawyers, our whole framework and discourse is really revolving around um, the outcome of this case between the Philippines and China, where those factors were not considered that the court was really looking at the, the facts on the ground as they existed uh, in the period 2014 to 2016. But you're right, surely we must seek to take into account uh, evolving technology 
to be able to sustain uh, populations on these features. And of course that will be a, a significant aspect of the argument that people from small island states will be making. That, you know, yes, there may well be legitimate debates as to whether or not some of these very, very small features can ever really be properly called islands. But if, an island, if a naturally formed feature, which is an island, which becomes so diminished so that it might now be considered a rock, can allow people to be sustained on that island through a range of artificial interventions, is that something that the law should take into account? I think that's where we're seeing this discourse and an issue in terms of the ability of science to play a role in terms of sustaining populations on those areas. Wonderful question. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so Article 121 with the definition of an island, as we've just been talking in different ways, that it will, it, with climate change and rising sea levels, obviously people, certain islands will no longer meet the definition because of the high tide, I can't remember how that was actually framed, but the high tide level of air is there, so, which is above water high tide. So yeah. that will change, obviously. There will no longer be islands. So what is your personal opinion of what's going to happen with that over time? I know it's lots of debate, and I'm sure you've got lots of debate, and put your mind in many different directions, but what do you think is going to go in your own mind? I think what we're going to see is that there's going to need to be an accommodation to take into account the existing legitimate entitlements of the island states which have legitimate island territories. And I think that they're gaining sufficient momentum and sufficient support within the international community that there will be some resolution of this issue. I'm not sure how that resolution will occur. Um, there is, for example, um, political movement to try to get what's called an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice, which would be just one aspect of that. The United States, which as you'll all appreciate in this room, can be pivotal in terms of some of these debates, seems to be quite open to some of those resolutions. And I think that one of the critical dimensions to think about it is that that sort of resolution would not really change anything because all it would do is maintain the status quo. It wouldn't necessarily result in enlargements of entitlements, but really just maintain the existing status quo entitlement. So to that end, I think the international community could be quite favourably disposed towards that sort of resolution in the future. Yes, Cyril. Uh, yes, uh, we've talked about islands, but it's interesting to know about the sea especially fisheries and dumping um, modalities, but also for mining the seabed. Would that change the status of the rock or island? And is there ways in which that is separated from the question of the status of the, of the island? I think if we, um, just kind of find the slide here, which So this slide here sort of highlighted the, the maritime entitlement that the island uh, enjoys. Um, of course, there's, there's a whole range of debates about uh, stewardship and conservation of the maritime uh, zones associated uh, with the, the waters that uh, a small island state uh, can enjoy. And, Certainly, some small island states are very, very concerned about the over-exploitation of the resources uh, in the adjoining uh, maritime zones. Uh, but at the same time, uh, that's the lifeblood of the economy of those particular states. There is also, of course, uh, a growing debate and focus on uh, environmental impact being caused by um, seabed mining. And, and one of the looming um, environmental global issues that, that, that you'll hear more and more about is deep seabed mining uh, in, in coming years. 
that debate is a little confused because for me, um, deep sea bed mining occurs way out here, way out here in an area well beyond uh, the continental shelf, uh, the outer edge of the continental shelf of Canada, for example. But in some parts of the world, um, seabed mining uh, is associated with mining activities which also occurs within the continental shelf. And there's a looming debate about the environmental impact associated with that. It's a very legitimate debate. And it's one which uh, a number of uh, environmental NGOs are particularly beginning to focus on. Um, and you need to also be aware of the fact that some small island states are major players in that particular uh, dynamic. And here in particular I'm thinking about Nauru, uh, which is sponsoring deep sea bed mining activities. So we've got um, a really interesting geopolitical, cultural, uh, economic and legal mix here in terms of how some small island states in particular see uh, the relationship between their ongoing capacity to be sustained as a state for purposes of international law and international relations and of course for their peoples and the environmental and economic issues associated with that in terms of mining activities in the oceans. Any other questions? Uh, just one yeah, quick one. Do you think now as we know that in Pacific in the Pacific rather, uh, you know, you see that there is a power struggle between, you know, uh, the Western bloc on one side and China and to some extent, you know, you know they see the authors and, you know, uh, the core and, um, do you see that, you know, in, in wider geopolitical context, the island warfare would be something, you know, would see a lot more like big powers, you know, actually fighting of these international laws related to islands and how would that impact the status of island in itself in international law? Because you know you have one side uh, which is you know as you know United Nations United States is not as committed to United Nations laws and convention, yet they have their ocean policy and they have their you know they consider that as part of you know the general principles of international law. And then you have China, which is also trying to rewrite the rules according to its own interests. Do you see that as a contested space? Do you see islands be uh, the geopolitical, you know, a, a, a subject of geopolitical warfare, if I may say so? Well, I can think of one island in particular, which has been the sole focus of that debate just the last month or so. Um, so the answer has to be yes, doesn't it? Um, that if we think about the the focus on the status of Taiwan uh, just in the last few months uh, and the geopolitical, legal, military issues associated with that, that just really highlights uh, that particular um, issue. And I guess that was one of the reasons why I sort of wanted to include this, um, this final slide here to get us to think about the status of, of, of these particular features. Um, now, at the moment, um, you know, could, could, I, could I have included um, another example of a special regime here? Um, quite possibly I could have, um, but uh, of course there's some, some entities which say that the Republic of China slash Taiwan is an independent island state. It has very little recognition uh, within the international community. Um, so we've got all sorts of views in terms of the status of Taiwan uh, in terms of this particular category. But I think your question is very pertinent because it very much highlights not so much the law of the sea dimensions, though there are some law of the sea dimensions, but it does very much highlight the very contested nature of, of islands in that particular area. But there are other islands that are significantly contested at the moment. One that I haven't mentioned um, uh, is the Chagos Archipelago, which is the subject of significant debate uh, in a range of international fora, it's the subject of a uh, advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice a few years ago, and the United Kingdom vigorously saying uh, that it is the territorial sovereign over the uh, Chagos Archipelago, uh, and um, uh, other states, of course, taking a, a very different view on that matter. So, island territories, I think you just have to accept, 
are quite contested in some parts of the world and uh, they, I, unfortunately I think they will remain so because of some of the factors we've been talking about this evening. Thank you. Well, at this point, I would like to ask Andrew Halliday to come on up and uh, thank you formally on our behalf, um, Dr. Rockwell. I, um, Andrew is another graduate of our program and is also an instructor in our uh, program, teaching our students, and is a PhD student. Um, and uh, just really thrilled that you could be here to do this. And Andrew, thanks. Thanks very much, Laurie. Well, I think to start off with, that, I would say thank you so much, uh, Don, for you and Beth joining us here. Thrilled to have you here. Um, it's so nice to have a perspective coming from Australia and Oceania, and kind of uh, bringing forward uh, different perspectives from different parts of the globe uh, to whet our appetites here as we start the fall semester. And for for the general public that are joining us here tonight, uh, and I think it's interesting to note that uh, in my interactions with with legal matters and with lawyers, lawyers like things black and white and don't necessarily like gray areas. So. I, I thank Don for, for bringing these gray areas in the, in the areas of international law as it relates to islands to the fore and really causing us to reflect upon these issues in this contemporary time, these issues that are of so, such great importance, uh, even something along the lines of what constitutes an island. It's been an issue that has, has uh, been uh, of considerable debate for island studies scholars uh, since this field has emerged, and as well also those issues around uh, such as the role of the maritime space. Uh, you talk about the blue economy and the importance of that, and really that the prevalence of that space for island societies, for island culture, for island economies, and what that means. And so I think that was fantastic. And I think it was Tommy Coe, uh, who was one of the presidents of, of one of the UNCLOSE um, conferences, which spanned 30 years, that called the Law of the Sea Convention really the Constitution for the Oceans. And so uh, I think in reflecting upon these contemporary issues, you can see the challenges that we face with uh, something that was a 30 year process uh, signed in 1982 and ratified in 1994 for issues that uh, are covered within that, perhaps not contemplated or reflect upon in that particular time. And so uh, I think it's great to have these issues brought to the fore. And again, I thank you so much. And I think uh, Lori's got a small uh, token of our appreciation here that we'd like to provide you for joining us here this evening. So uh, if everyone would perhaps uh, join another round of applause for, uh, for Dr. Rothwell, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, an introduction to island studies. You may have it already, in which case we can trade because we have a publishing company down the hall with a whole bunch of books, <laughs> although you might not want to carry a big one back to Australia, but um, I hope that uh, you enjoy it. And uh, this was written by Jim Randall, who was my predecessor here at the uh, Master of Arts and Island Studies program and the Institute. So um, I just want to add my thanks and uh, lovely to have you here and thank you so much for reaching out and it enriches us so beautifully um, when, when having you here to talk about this um, issue and very pertinent indeed. So um, I just want to offer a few thanks. Megan McDonald who isn't here tonight, she is our newsletter editor and she was the person who uh, worked with Dawn to organize the event and um, she'll be working on our next two lectures as well, which I'll talk to you about. I'll just tell you briefly in a moment. And thanks, Mike, for videotaping. If you want to recap or to share this with somebody else who couldn't be here tonight, it will be on our islandstudies.com website. We have a little YouTube channel that things link to, so it's a really important resource, and I'm going to be um, referring my students to it as well because it's a wonderful recap of of and uh, new thoughts and thinking in, in this regard. Um, our next lecture is going to be October 25th, uh, another Tuesday night lecture, same time, same place, and we'll be featuring doc Dr. Matthew Hatveny, who is a visiting scholar from Laval University and who will be speaking about one of his favorite islands and one that I know very little about is Anticosti Island, which apparently is our twin, Prince Edward Island twin island in the St. Lawrence. So uh, looking forward to hearing more about that. And then November 15th, we'll have um, our one of our favorites, uh, Dr. Ed McDonald, talking about um, uh, tourism on Prince Edward Island. Um, he doesn't want to repeat what he talked about for his book launch um, and of uh, the summer trade, but I'm sure that he'll come up with something equally fascinating about PEI tourism. So that is our program for the fall, and we'll just stay tuned. If anybody has any ideas for lectures or something, uh, please let me know. Send me an email, and uh, look 
forward to having you back here uh, in a few weeks' time. So thank you again, and um, safe journey home. I know you have a few more stops after this, but uh, really glad, and thank you again for reaching out to us. It's wonderful having you here. Thanks. Thank you.